Hello, I'm Kenneth Marcus, founder and chairman of the Louis D. Brandeis Center for Human Rights Under Law, which I founded a decade ago in order to advance the civil and human rights of the Jewish people and promote justice for all. Our primary work is fighting anti-Semitism in higher education. That primarily has meant representing students, although from time to time, we have also had to represent professors, staff members, and administrators who also have issues regarding anti-Semitism on the campus, which in their case means the workplace. For that reason, the Brandeis Center has been very interested in the problem of workplace discrimination on the campus and off the campus. We've had a series of webinars over the past year or so during COVID that has been a kind of a follower or a descendant of sort uh, from the programs that we have been putting on for years at law school uh, campuses aimed at law students and legal scholars. We plan to continue those as it's uh, safe to do it, but we're also pleased now to have these national online webinars, which can be accessed not only by law students and professors, but also by members of the general public. And today we are very pleased to have a special webinar featuring two members of the United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, Andrea Lucas and Keith Sonderling. Both of them are expert uh, in the issue of employment law and employment discrimination. As you may be aware, the Brandeis Center has been concerned about a wide range of employment anti-Semitism issues over the years. Certainly we have seen what you might call traditional and sometimes right-wing anti-Semitism in the workplace. Sometimes it's of a more left-wing or anti-Zionist variety. Sometimes it's simply workplace or campus anti-Semitism. Sometimes, and perhaps more disturbingly, the issues that we have faced, for example, uh, in the Stanford University case that we brought last year, what we have found is that disturbingly, some of the bias and hate incidents are appearing in the very institutions that are intended to address hate and bias. That is to say, the diversity, equity, and inclusion programs that are now mushrooming, mushrooming throughout higher education and throughout the workplace as a whole. So what we're finding is that sometimes, even in the DEI programs, we're seeing anti-Jewish stereotypes, biases, defamations, separation of Jews from other groups, so-called erasive anti-Semitism, which is to say a denial of what it means to have a Jewish identity. We're seeing this increasingly, and it is particularly problematic for those of us who are committed to civil rights protections for everyone, and yet the very institutions that are intended to protect against anti-Semitism are sometimes making the problem worse. So this brings us to the position where we need to know more about anti-Semitism, discrimination in the workplace. And in that context, we are thrilled to have these two experts. Both of them, Keith Sonderling and Andrea Lucas, are presidentially appointed and Senate confirmed to their positions as commissioner uh, of the EEOC. Commissioner Sonderling, also a former vice chair uh, Commissioner Lucas, uh, with deep experience and expertise in employment and labor law, and also uh, as a litigator at Gibson Dunn, and with a lengthy uh, background in dealing with uh, equal employment uh, opportunity law. Uh, Commissioner Sonderling, with a background that also includes a depth of labor law background, including senior positions with the Department of Labor. Both of them are senior officials, and we could not be more deeply honored than to have them with us today. In a moment, we will bring them on to discuss uh, combating anti-Semitism in the workplace. And then after that, I will bring out two of my colleagues, uh, Aliza Lewin, president of the Louis D. Brandeis Center, and Denise Katz-Prober, our director of legal initiatives. But for now, uh, please join me in welcoming Commissioner Sonderling and Commissioner Lucas. Delighted to be here. Thank you for having us. Um, all right, well, sh shall we get started? Let me share my screen here. All right, um, great. 
So good afternoon. I'm so delighted to be here with my colleague, Commissioner Sonderling and the Brandeis Center to discuss such an important topic, combating anti-Semitism in the workplace. And before we get started, I wanted to frame out our presentation a little bit for today. We're at a pivotal moment regarding anti-Semitism in our country, and we believe that the EOC needs to lead the charge against this rising tide of hatred. Too often, incidents in, uh, of anti-Semitism in the workplace go ignored, unreported, or unaddressed, but we cannot dismiss them. These insidious acts at work can be both violations of the law themselves and contribute to a culture of hate that may give rise to physical violence later. Protecting Jewish employees starts first with preventing discrimination and harassment before it even arises, and awareness and education are the key to prevention. We hope today's pre presentation and the subsequent discussion helps you better understand the threat that anti-Semitism poses to today's workplaces and employees, better identify both familiar and novel way an ways anti-Semitism can arise, and better know your rights if you experience such misconduct at work. So what is anti-Semitism? I imagine many of us are familiar with that, but the gold standard for the definition of anti-Semitism is the IHRA's definition, um, which I've noted up here, um, a certain perception of Jews, which may be expressed um, as hatred against Jews, uh, rhetorical and physical manifestations may occur. Um, there may be focuses on Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. Um, the IHRA, if you're not familiar with it, is both an intergovernmental and uh, a international organization. And this definition has been adopted by both the Trump and the Biden administrations, first in an executive order, adopting it by President Trump, and subsequently by a variety of uh, uh, members and uh, organizations within the Biden administration, including the State Department. And the IRHA has provided uh, a variety of contemporary examples of anti-Semitism, which are quite helpful. Um, I'm not gonna read them word for word, but you'll see as we discuss both in legal provisions, as well as some contemporary news examples um, about uh, some of the categories here. So um, obvious ones might include threats of violence or actual violence uh, towards Jews, um, but it can also include a range of stereotypical or demonizing hostile statements about Jews individually, as well as making statements about the powers of Jews as a collective. Um, it can also uh, uh, involve um, uh, conflating an individual Jewish individual with the state of Israel itself or having hostility related to tensions arising in the Middle East. Um, it can include Holocaust denial uh, and it can also include uh, discussions uh, about uh, um, denigrating people related to their loyalties towards Israel or their, their country. So why, um, Obviously, anti-Semitism has been a, a problem for a very long time, but why are we focused right now? Why are we saying that there's a rising tide? Well, um, some of our concern is based on some deeply troubling uh, statistics that Jewish advocacy groups have brought to uh, the public's attention recently. Um, for example, the American Jewish Committee reports that one out of every four American Jews has been victims of anti-Semitic incidents recently, and that 39% have changed their behavior, including limiting their activities to conceal their Jewishness based on concerns about anti-Semitism. That's horrifying. And even worse, the younger generation seems to be suffering this at increasing levels. Um, the Brandeis Center itself has found that 65% of openly Jewish students have felt unsafe and 50% of them have hidden their Jewish identity on campus. And one out of every three Jewish college students has personally experienced anti-Semitism, according to a survey by ADL and Hillel International. These are horrifying statistics. And even worse, to some degree, is that the general public does not seem to be aware of these concerns, or at least at the same level that American Jews do. Um, the AJC report found a significant gap in the concern over anti-Semitism between American Jews and the general public. While 90% of American Jews viewed anti-Semitism as a problem, only 60% of the general public did. And while over 80% of American Jews viewed anti-Semitism as increasing over the past five years, less than 50% of the general public did. Um, so clearly there's a significant awareness gap. And we're hoping that this event is one of many first steps towards remedying that awareness gap. But these horrifying statistics only tell part of the picture. 
about the rise and increase of anti-Semitism, it's important also to look at a few actual fact patterns or alleged fact patterns, particularly as relates to the workplace. So I'm going to have, show a few slides uh, highlighting a variety of news reports on uh, incidents of anti-Semitism. Um, before I move to them, I do want to note, just as a preface, that Commissioner Sonderling and I, of course, are simply highlighting public reporting on these, and we can't render judgment on any of the specific situations. And similarly, due to Title VII confidentiality rules, we cannot and are not commenting on any um, charges that may or may not be before the commission that might relate to any of these news reports. But that being said, to bring to life these statistics that we've just reviewed, and also the legal provisions that we'll talk about later in the presentation, we do think it's helpful to see some real world examples of the types of allegations that can arise. Um, so here's a few of them. The uh, reporting has been um, nationwide on some of these issues from the Wall Street Journal to the New York Times and a variety of other papers and newspapers. Um, in the workplace, the, uh, these kinds of allegations have included um, deeply troubling incidents where uh, Google had to remove one of its diversity executives over blog posts uh, in which uh, that individual allegedly had said that Jews had an insatiable appetite for war. So again, making collective demonizing statements about uh, Jewish individuals, tying it to Israel as well. Um, other novel incidents uh, just uh, in the past few days, a tech executive in Utah allegedly made some uh, conspiracy theory statements about COVID-19 and vaccinations related to uh, Jewish individuals' involvement in that and blasted it out to a wide array of people. He resigned after um, news reporting on that broke. Um, other incidents include uh, the referenced allegations and deeply troubling ones that the Brandeis Center has brought to light about Stanford's diversity, equity, and inclusion program, uh, which got coverage all the way up to the New York Times um, in opinion pieces on that, uh, situations allegedly involving um, segregating Jewish employees in white affirming and white passing uh, uh, affinity groups uh, separated out from other um, uh, individuals of color, uh, dismissing allegations of Zoom bombings with uh, swastikas um, out of concerns that it would draw attention away from anti-Black, anti-racism concerns. Um, other, a little more traditional, but also deeply concerning allegations um, recently involved uh, Philadelphia's uh, local government uh, commerce director uh, resigned after reports of anti-Semitic re uh, remarks uh, ranging after a period of years creating a hostile work environment. Um, and then we've all, I've also highlighted um, one of uh, a, a prominent uh, book publishing executive also here, also uh, a Black Jewish executive posted a statement affirming their the organization's commitment to um, their Jewish employees and uh, protecting against uh, anti-Semitism, and then herself received a tremendous outpouring of anti-Semitic criticism of her, eventually leading to her resignation. Um, all deeply troubling allegations and ones that I think are going to um, touch on a variety of different potential causes of action that uh, Commissioner Sonderling will be reviewing later on. Um, one more slide on this. Um, as uh, uh, Ken mentioned at the start of this, uh, we often do see that uh, in academia, that's also a workplace. So um, there have been recent reports noting anywhere from public school teachers uh, making students reenact uh, scenes from the Holocaust, terrible, um, to uh, a increased focus by DEI leads in universities um, on uh, anti-Zionist uh, focuses uh, and uh, concerns that diversity efforts that are very well-meaning may actually end up um, resulting in people fomenting anti-Semitism. Uh, another notable 
review of anti-Semitism uh, in the workplace comes from the organization Stop Anti-Semitism, um, which recently re uh, released a very interesting re uh, report card on 25 major corporations, grading them on how they are addressing anti-Semitism in the workplace, a really interesting report that um, people should should take a look, noting about how full-throated organizations were to uh, condemning anti-Semitism, whether or not they provided training on it and other issues like that. I'm gonna turn it over to Commissioner Sonderling. All right, well, thank you, Commissioner Lucas. And again, thank you to the Brandeis Center for having us here. So let's talk about the law. There are a number of laws that prohibit religious discrimination, specifically anti-Semitic discrimination. Today, I'm gonna to discuss some of the most relevant I'm going to start with uh, our law, Title VII, which prohibits discrimination in employment based on race, color, religion, sex, including pregnancy, sexual orientation, gender identity, and national origin. We're going to discuss this a lot later. But um, Title IX of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which is enforced by the Department of Education, prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, and national origins in programs and activities receiving federal financial assistance from the Department of Education. So although Title IX does not specifically cover discrimination based on religions, individuals who face discrimination on the basis of race, color, or national origin do not lose those protections under Title IX for also being a member that shares common religious practices of a group. So for instance, discrimination against uh, the Jewish people may give rise to a Title IX violation when that discrimination is based on an individual's race, color, or national origin. And specifically something, you know, really like to highlight in December of 2019, there was an executive order 13899 called combating anti-Semitism. And in that order, it directed federal agencies when investigating and enforcing Title IX to consider the definition, IHRA's definition of anti-Semitism, which you just heard. So another law that prohibits anti-Semitism is the Fair Housing Act, which is enforced by HUD. There, it prohibits discrimination in housing, among other things, um, based on religion. The Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crime Prevention Act makes it a federal crime to willfully cause bodily injury or attempt to do so using a dangerous weapon because of the victim's actual perceived race, color, religion, or national origin. The Church Arson Prevention Act prohibits the intentional defacement, damage, or destruction of religious real property because of the religious nature of the property. The Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act prohibits local governments from adopting or enforcing land use regulations that discriminate against religious assemblies or which unjustifiably burden religious exercise. So that's just a general overview of the varying laws that um, protect uh, all religion in and out of the workplace. So the next slide. So let's talk about what we do here at the EEOC. The EEOC is the federal agency responsible for enforcing federal laws that make it illegal to discriminate in the workplace. The EEOC's mission is to prevent and remedy unlawful employment discrimination and advance equal opportunity for all in the workplace. In addition to Title VII, which I just told you about, we also administer and enforce the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, the Equal Pay Act, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. So the laws here at the EEOC protect a job applicant or an employee very broadly from discrimination based upon a person's race, color, religion, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, pregnancy, national origin, age, disability, or genetic information. And it's all kinds of work situations, including hiring, firing, promotions, training, wages, benefits, and it prevents harassment and retaliation. And it's important you have that background before we get into some of the specific examples about anti-Semitism. Helps if I unmute myself, sorry about that. Um, so the EEOC is always always monitoring to see uh, when there is a particular rise in any particular type of discrimination or a particular group is being scrutinized. And in May, we noticed that there was a serious rise in anti-Semitic violence. Um, and I was proud to lead um, the charge to having the EEOC um, unanimously approve a resolution denouncing that rise in anti-Semitism. 
Um, and that resolution noted that we condemned in the strongest possible terms the recent violence, harassment, and acts of bias against Jewish persons, expressed our heartfelt sympathy and to and solidarity with victims and their families, and reaffirmed our commitment to combat religious, ethnic, and national origin-based harassment and all their forms of unlawful discrimination and to ensure equal opportunity, inclusion, and dignity for all throughout America's workplaces. I'm proud to have been able to spearhead that effort. Um, I'm not Jewish myself, but I think it's important that um, we all ally ourselves together to say never again. And that includes unequivocally stating that anti-Semitism is unlawful and unacceptable in our workplaces and in our communities. Um, and I'm proud to ally with um, Jewish colleagues like Commissioner Sonderling um, and others on the commission. Um, I think it's really meaningful that we had a unanimous resolution denouncing anti-Semitism uh, this year. And again, I wanna really thank Commissioner Lucas for spearheading um, that resolution. It was passed unanimously. And uh, as, as a Jew, uh, my grandparents were in the Holocaust uh, very uh, touching that Commissioner Lucas um, took the lead on that, and we're all um, very appreciative of that. So let's now talk about what the actual definition of religion means. It's very broad. Title VII's uh, definition of religion is extremely broad. It covers all aspects of religion's observations as a practice as well as a belief, not just practices that are mandated or, by, or prohibited by a tenet of an individual's faith. So religions includes not only traditional organized religions, such as Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, or Buddhism, but beliefs that are new or uncommon, or that may be or even illogical or unreasonable to others. For Title VII purposes, as long as the religious belief is sincere and meaningful to that employee, our laws cover it. So there's a lot of theories of discrimination under Title VII in our law. The, the, the first of that is what's called disparate treatment. And that's probably the easiest. And then just think of it, um, sorry to give a law school lesson here, but think of it essentially as intentional discrimination, where you're saying, based upon somebody's protected characteristics, I'm going to discriminate against you in the workplace. In the context of discrimination against Jewish people, direct examples can include firing or not hiring someone solely because the person is Jewish, paying someone less because the person is Jewish, not promoting someone because the employee is Jewish, or assigning less desirable work conditions or other terms of employment because that person is Jewish. So it's just that direct discrimination. Now, there are some times when it comes to religion for specific religious employers, education institutes, or associations, where the law allows hiring decisions to be made directly upon someone's religious belief. But we can discuss those later, and it's a little bit beyond the scope of today's presentation. So, so for more examples of types of discriminations we see when, when it comes to anti-Semitism, another type is job segregation. So Title VII prohibits workplace or job segregation based on any of those protected characteristics, including religion. So the law prevents an employer from limiting, segregating, or classifying applicants or employees based on that protected characteristic. So related to Jewish employees, you know, examples could be assigning a Jewish employee to a non-customer contact position because of actual or feared customer preference, forcing or pressuring Jewish employees to attend affinity group or separate diversity training based on their perceived race or color, or religion, or national origin. We're instituting a generally applicable policy prohibiting employees from wearing head coverings in customer facing job positions and refusing any religious accommodations. Speaking of accommodations, Title VII requires an employer to reasonably accommodate an employee's religious beliefs or practices as long as doing so would cause more than a minimal burden on the operations of the employer's business. This means an employer may be required to make adjustments to the work environment to allow that employee to practice his or her religion. Examples relating to Jewish people are adjusting Jewish employees' work schedules so employee can observe the Sabbath or other religious holidays, granting Jewish employee exemption from employers' vaccine mandates, providing Jewish employees with exceptions to policy against head coverings or facial hair, 
were granting exemptions from portions of training which would require Jewish employees to affirm certain practices or beliefs in conflict with the religious beliefs. So uh, more, uh, more of what Title VII protects, it also protects harassment. And harassment broadly is any unwelcome conduct, such as offensive remarks that is based on one of those protected characteristics. Here, we'll talk about religion. So examples in the anti-Semitism context could be using or failing to address anti-Semitic slurs or statements in the workplace, placing swastikers on desks of Jewish employees or via Zoom bombing, we're telling Jewish employees that Jews are powerful members of society who contribute to systemic racism, or what we've seen recently is circulating conspiracy theories about COVID-19s or vaccines that blames the Jews. Also examples could be characterizing all Jewish people as privileged based on an assumption about their race or color, trivializing the Holocaust by comparing it to mask or vaccine mandates, or mocking female Orthodox Jewish employees for modest clothing. And then one that you see a lot is the dispro disproportionate criticism of Israel or con conflation of all Jews with Israel. And finally, uh, retaliation. Our laws pro prohibit all retaliation. Um, in examples, it could be from opposing an employment practice that discriminates based on religion or exercising your right, like filing a charge. And examples here is firing an an employee after an employee complained to a supervisor regarding anti-Semitic harassment or demoting or changing any term of employment, such as wages, job duties, title, based on that employee exercising their right, for instance, coming here to the EEOC to file a charge of discrimination. Um, thanks so much, Keith, of uh, that great overview. And um, we're hoping that through educating people about uh, their rights, that we'll see more charges uh, in response to anti-Semitic misconduct at work. Um, we do get a fair amount of uh, charges thus far. Um, uh, Jewish charging parties usually comprise about 8 to 10 percent of individuals who file religious discrimination charges. Um, but of course, uh, anti-Semitic con uh, conduct can be broader than simply a religious discrimination charge. Um, it might touch on national origin. It could be based on uh, race, ancestry, which can sometimes, depending on the jurisdiction that you're in, fall under national origin or uh, race discrimination could involve color, could even involve Gina. Um, we've talked mostly about Title VII today, um, and uh, often that is going to sound in the, in the prohibition against religious discrimination, but um, people should be aware that there are a variety of bases that can encompass anti-Semitic uh, harassment or discrimination. Um, uh, we do often see minority religions, whether it's uh, Jews or Sikhs, Muslims, as overrepresented in terms of their population in the United States and filing charges. Um, sadly, that likely indicates that those uh, faiths often uh, suffer more harassment and discrimination, retaliation um, for their uh, beliefs. Um, Turning to EEOC discrimination cases, though, um, I do think it is unfortunate the agency has only had the opportunity to bring three cases since 2014 on behalf of Jewish parties, and I'm hopeful that we're going to see um, more litigation just to take a public stand against anti-Semitic harassment. Um, the commission very admirably uh, really led the charge in um, enforcement and prevention uh, uh, efforts. Um, um, after 9-11, when many Muslims and also uh, Sikhs and Hindus who might be mistaken for Muslims faced a serious rise in harassment and discrimination in the workplace. Um, and here too, now uh, that we're seeing these troubling spikes in anti-Semitism in the workplace and in the public sphere, I hope that we'll do uh, similar efforts on, on really spotlighting that through prevention and enforcement on behalf of Jewish individuals. Um, I want to wrap up with some best practices for employers and employees. Um, Keith and I are both going to cover that. Um, Commissioner Sonner, if you wanted to. Yeah, I mean, the first, first is to, to speak up unequivocally in support of Jewish employees against all kind of anti-Semitism, just as hopefully everyone would for any kind of um, religion, 
uh, gender, national origin, race, any of the laws we cover, it's really important now for, for not just those being subject to discrimination, but others who are seeing it and aware of it to speak up, to go to HR, whether it's on their behalf or on behalf of the individual being discriminated, and, and to, to make sure that not only is it stopping, but there's proper systems in place um, to prevent this from ever occurring. Yep, uh, having you know really clear policies, clear trainings, um, and you need to make sure that you're doing this in 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 a way that it considers novel applications. So, being aware that social media increasingly can bleed into the workplace, whether it's your own company's work uh, uh, place, uh, intranets, Slack. Um, Twitter feeds that are for the company or ones that are adjacent to it, or even private social media that ends up impacting the workplace, you should have clear guidance that addresses that. We've seen a ton of anti-Semitic harassment occurring online. Um, you should have clear policies about religious accommodations. Um, and you should make sure that you explicitly address anti-Semitism in your anti-harassment, anti-discrimination, diversity trainings. And on the flip side, in addition to explicitly condemning anti-Semitism in DEI related and anti-harassment related uh, policies, you should carefully audit those policies, make sure that the policies and trainings that are meant to encourage diversity and inclusion are actually inclusive for everyone and don't end up um, inadvertently or perhaps um, um, ill-advisedly uh, contributing to anti-Semitism. Um, in ways that can include assumptions and stereotypes about power or privilege, racial identity, or conclusion based on racial and ethnic disparities. Um, uh, you just need to make sure that you're really thoughtfully auditing those materials. And, and as I said earlier, you know, speak up, educate yourself about what your rights are in, in the workplace. Um, we have tremendous amount of uh, guidance on our EEOC uh, website. But again, it's not just uh, about you, it's about your coworkers as well and making sure that they're educated and that you stand up for any potential um, discrimination that they may be incurring in the workplace. And, and really, you have options available to you. That's why the, the EEOC is here. If you've been discriminated against based upon any of the characteristics I discussed earlier or specific to this, um, discussion, your religion, you have the rights to come to the EEOC and file a charge of discrimination um, with the EEOC. Now, um, we have all the information. Uh, I don't want to take up too much time how to file a charge. It's all online. Um, you can go to our public portal. So you can call your local EEOC office um, or, or also deal with your local state um, fair employment practice agency, but generally um, in most states, you have around 300 days from the time the discrimination occurred. In some states, it's 180 days um, to file a charge with the EEOC before um, losing those rights. So all that information is available on our EEOC um, website. We have uh, 800 numbers. We have a, a website. Um, it's, it's all there for you. And generally, just very briefly, if a charge is filed, the EEOC um, will investigate it. There's various um, ways that the charge can be uh, moved forward, whether it's through mediation, through resolution, or an actually a full investigation. And I know you see a little flow chart here where it can the cases can be investigated. There can be no cause. There can be actual cause. There could be settlement and resolutions. Um, without litigation, there can be EEOC litigation. Just, just know that there's a lot of remedies out there for you if you've been discriminated against because of anti-Semitism, and the EEOC stands ready to investigate those claims. And, in, and as Commissioner Sonderling mentioned, if you have questions about the legal causes of action um, that uh, your uh, incident of anti-Semitism might um, sound in, uh, we, we have a, a lot of guidance, policy guidance um, uh, that is on our website that you can look into, including some brand new religious discrimination policy guidance that Commissioner Sonderling and I were both proud to um, have one of the first major policy uh, documents that we voted in during our tenure here on the commission. We both joined about a year ago. Um, it's uh, an a uh, fairly exhaustive, uh, significant policy document um, that we hope you'll take a look at. But again, um, don't uh, feel like you have to be restricted solely to religious discrimination if you've suffered anti-Semitism. Um, it could sound in a variety of different protected bases. And um, um, 
also keep in mind that there is no orthodoxy level or um, observance level that uh, that uh, that you kind of have to threshold that you have to hit to bring a charge or to complain about anti-Semitism. It's always unacceptable um, in the workplace. And um, regardless of your level of observance or religious affiliation, um, if you've been targeted because you were Jewish uh, in the workplace, um, you may have a charge. So um, uh, take a look at all of the information we have on our website. And um, we're delighted to uh, have a conversation now about our presentation and other uh, related issues. Uh, thank you, commissioners. Um, thank you sincerely, both for your words today and also for what you're doing. Uh, I'll mention that the Q&A box is open for uh, members of the audience who've already begun submitting some questions. Uh, there's also uh, some chat going on in the chat box. And while that's harder to monitor, I will observe that in addition to a uh, conversation, I've also observed in the chat box uh, gratitude um, that I would like to convey to you. Members of the audience have expressed gratitude, um, not just for your participation, but also for uh, taking a stand on these issues. Uh, and I think that they mean um, including the resolution that you uh, discussed as well as the other work that you're doing. At this point, I will ask uh, my colleagues, uh, Aliza Lewin, uh, president of the Louis D. Brandeis Center and uh, founding partner of Lewin and Lewin Law Firm, and also Denise Katz-Prober, uh, our um, director of legal initiatives and a longtime uh, former prosecutor, uh, to join us um, for a bit of discussion uh, as we see whether additional uh, questions may come in from the audience. Uh, Aliza, uh, did you have any uh, questions or comments for the commissioners? Well, first, I'd like to thank both of them for joining us and for that fantastic presentation. It really, I know, as, as Kim said, the audience appreciated it and we appreciate it. We appreciate your focus too on this issue of anti-Semitism. So I did see also in some of the questions and it ties in, you have done this wonderful job at explaining that religious discrimination, right? That anti-Semitism can sometimes manifest in ways broader than what people might traditionally just think of as discrimination um, on the basis of their religious practice, but that Jews could also be targeted on the basis of their shared ancestry and ethnicity, their national ethnic origin um, discrimination. So one question that's arisen is, how, what kind of training is provided in the federal agencies to the EEO offices to make sure that even the EEO officers there in the agencies understand that anti-Semitism can be actionable, not only, right, Jews are not only targeted as on the basis of religion, but these broader categories as well, so that they recognize and understand that and appreciate that as well. If you can talk just about the training. That's a great question. And, and, and honestly, to some degree, I think it um, is, a, is a good um, incentive for us to encourage to have more public facing training and policies. Um, you know, we often do frequently asked questions or technical assistance documents. Um, I think it'd be great for us to put out more information on that. Um, I think there is general awareness within the agency. The anti-Semitism can sound uh, on a variety of bases, but I don't think it's always well understood by the public. Um, so I I, I think uh, Commissioner Sonnerly and I both agree that it'd be wonderful to have more public facing training on that. And, and also too, to your point, the EEOC enforces these laws against uh, the federal government. And uh, this, this type of discrimination can not only happen in the private sector, but could also happen in the federal government. So it's incumbent upon our Office of uh, Federal mm -hmm. Operations to make sure that each individual federal agencies, which you know, many of them employ tens of thousands of employees, um, have the same training and those employees, uh, the Jewish employees in the federal government, uh, know that they have the same rights within uh, the federal workforce as they would in the private sector. Uh, thank you. Uh, Denise, uh, did you have any uh, questions or comments? Thank you, Ken. I, I also wanna echo my colleagues and members of the audience. Um, to thank the commissioners, not only for your interest in the issue of combating anti-Semitism, but also um, for your commitment to, um, to really pushing back against this scourge. So thank you. I wanted to ask a question um, 
about the DEI trainings uh, and anti-Semitism that unfortunately um, we've seen can manifest in these trainings that you have, um, that you referenced in, in your presentation. Um, we've often seen, as, as Ken noted in, in his introduction, um, the use of adverse racial stereotyping, not only against Jews in these trainings sometimes, but also against other individuals um, or groups who are either identified as white or perceived as white. Um, and, and sometimes what we've seen is that there are kind of two problematic consequences. The first being that you have discrete targeted acts of discrimination that are directed at a specific individual employee, but then you might also have sort of the creation through these trainings of almost an orthodoxy in the workplace where employees find it to be intimidating, they're, they're afraid kind of to speak up um, and uh, they're afraid that, that they're going to appear as though maybe they disagree or don't accept this orthodoxy. So I wanted to ask the commissioners, um, if, you can, if you can unpack these issues and address them maybe in the context of the legal framework that you had explained and discussed in your presentations, in this situation, in these types of situations, what legal protections do employees have, and when is it appropriate for them to, um, you know, to raise these um, is maybe issues of discrimination? Um, not only when it comes to individual targeted um, discriminatory incidents, but also sort of a, maybe a toxic culture or a hostile environment in the workplace that might be created through these trainings. Um, well, you, you, the end point you raise is, is a great jumping off point that trainings themselves can sometimes lead to a hostile work environment. And I don't think that that's always super well understood. Um, typically, when you see case law, a lot of times training related uh, claims often are I didn't get trained or I wanted to get more training. Um, but here we're talking about a situation where policies and trainings themselves can um, give rise to or contribute to a hostile work environment. And I, and I think that that's um, sort of like the foundation for people to think about um, when you engage in trainings or you circulate materials to all of your employees, um, you are essentially affirming them as your company's policy. Um, and if you have anti-Semitic statements or things that could be viewed as anti-Semitic that can contribute um, to a hostile work environment because any policy that engages in discrimination or harassment on the face of its policy itself can um, be sort of foundational to a hostile work environment. So that's one area. And so um, employees, if they see that there has been offensive material should feel comfortable speaking up against it, reporting it to HR or management. Um, that's always the first step. If you don't complain, it can be much harder to protect your rights later. Um, and then after you've internally reported, then um, consider whether or not you need to move to the next step, which is externally reporting to the EEOC. Um, and thank you. So Commissioner Lucas, let me just uh, expand on that a little bit um, within DEI programs, but besides just training. Um, oftentimes when there's a bias or hate incident on a university campus, uh, a response from administrators is that uh, the DEI program is on it. The diversity, equity, and inclusion program are doing something about it, whether it's an investigation or, or otherwise. And sometimes the DEI program gets it right, but not always. Um, we've not only seen uh, anecdotal evidence, but there's recent research from educational uh, uh, analysts, including in a recent um, heritage-funded uh, uh, report, uh, indica indicating uh, both uh, anti-Israel bias, but also anti-Semitism within DEI programs as evidenced by social media postings by employees of these DEI programs, uh, which is particularly problematic when these are the people that um, either professors or students or, other, or others are supposed to go to. So any other suggestions, if a university really wants to deal with this problem, what, what can they do to make sure, not just in training, but in the, in the whole range of activities that DEI does, uh, that they are part of the solution and not part of the problem? 
I think it's it's important to remember that inclusion is only inclusion if you're truly inclusive of everyone. Um, you can't uh, assume that because someone is quote unquote a model minority that they are not worthy of respect. You can't conclude that some kinds of discrimination are acceptable and not others. Um, you really just need to be really even handed. Um, I know Commissioner Sonderling has talked a lot about how we just we have to enforce all of the laws and protect everyone. That's why I read that laundry list of the of the various protected class and the various laws we enforce here and the various types of work scenarios that we uh, that you can't discriminate against. So it's just important to know that everyone uh, everyone has rights and everyone has rights equally. And um, we're duty bound here, um, not just only in our positions, but why Congress created this agency is to enforce all of them. And, and to make sure that uh, all people, whether it's a national origin claim or religion claim or an LGBT claim, uh, you know, it's all the same to us. They're protected under the law and we have to enforce all of them. And everyone has those equal rights. So it's just important for any of these programs to make sure that everyone knows that the whole point of the law and the whole point is, is, is everyone is given that same opportunity ignoring those, those protected characteristics. So it's just very important that these programs emphasize that. I think also that, you know, DEI individuals should also have a, a really um, searching inward look at whether or not um, over focuses on people as a collective can feed into um, common concerns of anti-Semitism. Lots of times anti-Semitism arises because um, you are viewing Jews as a collective, you are de-individualizing people. And that frankly is true of a lot of racism and discrimination in general. When you um, engage in any kind of uh, focus of someone on a collective, whoever they are, um, it can breed um, problematic conduct, um, but it can be really stark when we're talking about anti-Semitism. Likewise, um, anytime you're focusing on concerns about power and disparities, those are traditional um, uh, avenues for anti-Semitism to enter into a workplace, but sometimes some focuses on recent DEI pushes are talking a lot about power and disparities, and it can turn toxic it quickly if you don't have clear stands against anti-Semitism in your policies, in your training, um, in your culture. Um, a horrifying, but I think a crystal clear example of how this can arise, um, I believe it was the University of Illinois, uh, a flyer was uh, distributed on campus and it had a pyramid and said, ending white privilege uh, starts first with ending Jewish privilege. And it talks about disparities in um, white individuals having certain levels of, of race, uh, of wealth. And then it talks about the percentage of Jewish individuals and makes allegations uh, uh, about those disparities um, needing to end. But of course, these are age old concerns about and stereotypes about Jews having um, more power or influence that can turn toxic extremely quickly. Um, just sort of uh, now in a novel context, uh, playing on concepts of critical race theory or systemic racism. Um, it's obviously a, a good idea to have um, critical conversations about uh, racism against any number of people in our workplaces, diversity and equity inclusion uh, efforts can be tremendously wonderful if done right, uh, done correctly. But if you are excluding um, Jews from that conversation, if you're ignoring the risks towards engaging in anti-Semitic tropes, um, you can end up hurting the very people who you thought you were helping. Um Commissioner Sonderling, did you have anything to add? No, well said. Okay. Um, I was just, just going to note, I think that that's so important, your final comment, Commissioner Lucas, because I do think that um, there are, even within the Jewish community, those who are afraid to try and um, push for inclusion of Jewish identity in some of these pro programs, because they're afraid that somehow that means they are not taking seriously the, um, the discrimination of other groups and that they're uh, insisting on focus being on the Jewish community. And yet, I think what you've just said is that if you really want to be able to have inclusion, as you said, for all, then you have to include 
Jewish identity, because otherwise what happens is these programs that are meant to combat and, and, and educate about bias and discrimination end up inadvertently fostering a, a negative feeling or worse towards Jews. So it's for the benefit of everybody, right? And, 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 the, and the organization that the Jewish identity be included in these programs. I just think it's really important for um, HR and lawyers in general to be making sure that they're looking at sort of novel ways that age old discrimination can be uh, coming up. And that can include in your very own trainings that um, were well meant to start and go awry quickly. Um, it can involve um, social media. Um, uh, Commissioner Sonderling has done a, a phenomenal job of really increasing awareness about how discrimination can occur in a, uh, AI contexts. Um, so you just really have to stay up to date um, uh, and, and have policies and trainings to, to, to pay attention to that. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know that I've seen any anti-Semitism in um, sort of tech related issues. It's possible Commissioner Sonderling has, because um, he's really been studying that quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it, it's just, you have to look everywhere and whether it's, it's done by uh, a computer or a certain industry, uh, you know, for the EEOC, uh, our jurisdiction is uh, for anyone <laughs> essentially, uh, for the most part in, in the workplace. So we need to be aware of every industry, uh, every type of decision. Um, it, it really has to have that awareness that these factors cannot play any role. We have um, a little bit, uh, about eight minutes left, um, and I don't want to intrude on, on your time. You've been so generous. There are lots of additional questions. Um, some of the comments have gone to uh, unions, um, and in particular, there are a couple of questions and comments relating either to uh, uh, unions of um, college instructors or uh, teachers' unions, uh, and they're specifically about unions that have made um, strongly uh, anti-Israel resolutions or statements on behalf of their uh, membership, which uh, arguably cross a line into uh, anti-Semitism. So first, uh, does the EEOC have uh, jurisdiction over unions? And are there any circumstances in which a union might, uh, through its uh, statements or resolutions and crossing a line, uh, create problems under employment law? We, we do have jurisdictions uh, over unions. Um, and uh, as far as uh, statements uh, that the unions are putting out or, or corporations are, are putting out, you know, there, there's nothing preventing um, any corporation and a lot have federal agencies like the EEOC did condemning uh, uh, the anti-Semitic attacks or unions from putting out statements regarding um, you know, prohibition against anti-Semitism or raising these awarenesses, not just about Judaism, but, but any religions. Now it gets very complicated, especially um, when, when statements are put out about a, a, uh, Israel a, as a country and when that becomes uh, anti-Semitic and that could be a very uh, thorny uh, issue. And then it could t potentially turn, uh, move over from religious discrimination to potential uh, national origin uh, discrimination. So, you know, issues like that, if it's based upon somebody's national origin and they have a hostile work environment, uh, you know, based upon those outside of religion, um, those are also protected under uh, our laws under national origin discrimination. And I know Commissioner Lucas has something to say about this as well. Yeah, one thing to think about is there obviously is a difficult interplay between um, when you might have a union or union members in particular making statements that could uh, constitute harassment or discrimination um, and whether or not it's protected speech. Um, but uh, there has been uh, relatively recent developments in terms of the NLRB, which is the primary focus for unfair labor charges, for example, they have primary jurisdiction over that. Um, the interplay between the EEOC and the NLRB on that, um, the general position currently is that 
uh, were, were something to actually rise to the level of um, unlawful harassment. Um, you can think about slurs. There, there is a realm in which um, it falls out of sight of protected characteristics, uh, or sorry, protected conduct. So um, in less legalese, uh, if you have a union member who is engaging in uh, organizing uh, and talking about um, the state of Israel, if they engage in anti-Semitic slurs while they're doing that, the fact that there may be some protected uh, uh, organizing going on does not give them license to engage in anti-Semitic slurs. So I think sometimes people are a little uh, worried about um, how that might play in, but I think companies should uh, keep in mind that um, while it's important to protect a worker's rights to uh, unionize and organize, um, that doesn't give them license to engage in um, uh, unlawful harassment. Um, so um, that I, I think that uh, uh, you know the EOC's position always is that um, unlawful harassment, um, slurs, anti-Semitic um, statements are always unacceptable, no matter the context. Very good, thank you. And with just a few minutes um, uh, remaining, uh, we did get um, a question about religious accommodations um, and in particular about um, Sabbath observance. Um, I wonder if you uh, have anything to say about um, that for audience members who are concerned uh, about the degree to which they have any uh, protection uh, if their sincere religious uh, beliefs require them to observe uh, the Sabbath. Well, they have a lot of protection. It just, it depends. It's so, such a hard question to answer because it is so individually specific to that employee, to that industry, to see if the burden on that employer, you know, essentially creates uh, more of a de minimis uh, ask for them. So, you know, it, it could be different in an office uh, situation um, where the work can be done at another time. But if you're, if you're on a manufacturing line, whether it's a uh, religious garb that may cause a danger to the employee or other employees. Uh, it's, it's so fact specific, but the, the most important thing is that the burden is on the employee to go to the employer to ask for that religious accommodation. And, and the employer has to engage in that process to see if they can make an accommodation for that religious worker um, based upon their individual work situation. And you know, we went out over some examples of what those reasonable accommodations could be. Uh, allowing them not to work on certain days if practical, but it, um, it's so fact specific to that individual work situation. However, what's not fact specific is that you have the ability to ask for that accommodation. Absolutely. It, it's always going to be a balancing test um, and, and it will be case by case and, and, and uh, a situation by situation, but um, workers should know their rights to um, seek and pursue an accommodation. And the best way um, to have a, a robust accommodation process is to actually have training on that. Um, certainly both of us have seen in the COVID-19 context, whether we're specifically talk about, talking about Sabbath requests or other accommodations to COVID related protocols, um, vaccine mandates, et cetera, um, the best way to make sure that you have a compliant workplace to protect employees and to handle it appropriately is to have a clear policy, have a clear religious accommodation form, provide training on it. Um, it doesn't always mean that you're going to get the accommodation that you requested, but um, it's really important to make sure that you're right to pursue that accommodation, to have a healthy interactive process um, uh, is protected. Um, uh, so ne not necessarily a foregone uh, conclusion about what the outcome of that interactive process will be, but you have the right to go through that process, just like someone under the ADA seeking a disability accommodation um, has that right as well. Um, very good. Um, well, that brings us uh, pretty much to the, the end. And we're within our last uh, minute. So I would just want to say uh, to both of you commissioners um, that we are grateful both for your time today, uh, for the resolution uh, the commissioner has done uh, for your work and for making clear uh, to some in the Jewish community who have doubted whether they have uh, adequate protections that there are within the United States government uh, officials uh, who are dedicated to protecting the rights of all Americans, including Jewish Americans. Um, I believe that this uh, presentation will be um, available uh, afterwards in video for 
those of us who might have lost connection for a, a portion um, uh, of this um, uh, or who want to hear it later. Uh, but again, I, I, I thank you uh, very much for participating. I thank everyone in the audience who's joined us. We will continue um, later in the spring with additional webinars. Take care. Thank you so much.